Please open your Bibles to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter six. The three and a half year ministry of Jesus was punctuated by four Passovers. At the first Passover, he met Nicodemus and taught us that even the best of us need Jesus. At the second Passover, he met the man by the pool of Bethesda and taught us that even the poorest of us can have Jesus. And of course, the fourth Passover was when Jesus was crucified. The third Passover, Jesus did not actually attend in person. This is called the time of the great divide. The story is here in John, the sixth chapter, in some ways, one of the saddest in all of scripture. Because John, the sixth chapter in the second verse says, and great multitudes followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. The chapter begins here with great multitudes following Jesus. As a matter of fact, the Greek is a little more precise. It indicates that they kept on continuously following, following, following great masses of people continuously following Jesus. Jesus was at the height of his popularity. But the chapter closes shortly after verse 66, which says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. What a contrast. What happened in John 6? Why did the masses suddenly forsake? Because there is one thing about Christianity that those people could not accept. There is one thing about Christianity that most people today cannot accept. There is one thing about Christianity that perhaps many of us in this congregation do not accept. And that was what Jesus taught in John the sixth chapter that the primary purpose of Christianity is to change us and not our circumstances. Many have always been, and perhaps some of us today, are following Christ because we feel that he will make life easier for us. In John, the sixth chapter, the crowds turned away from Jesus when they learned for a certainty that the primary purpose of Christianity is to change us and not our circumstances. Now it's possible to follow Christ and to be lost because we have followed him for the wrong reasons. Man is by nature so self-centered that he can find a way to do virtually anything selfishly. A man or a woman can get married for selfish reasons. He wants a housekeeper, she wants security. And this most selfless of all human relationships can be entered into for very selfish reasons. We can serve Christ for selfish reasons. There are a thousand benefits of serving Jesus. But if we serve him because of the benefits, we are not really following Jesus at all. We are only following our own self-centered desires and inclinations. Now the multitudes were attracted by the miracles that Jesus did. And here in the first part of John chapter 6, talks about Jesus feeding the 5,000. They wanted to make him their king, but he refused. He dismissed his disciples and then the multitude, and then he disappeared. 
They didn't catch up with him until the next day. I'd like us to take a look at that story together in verses 22 to 26. John chapter 6, verses 22 to 26. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Boys and girls, did you ever go feeding ducks at the pond? Now, right after my wife and I got married, we're in a uh, college town, Seventh-day Adventist college town. And on the campus there at Southwestern, there was a pond right adjacent to the campus. And they had ducks and geese there. And one of the popular things to do, one of the things we enjoyed doing with our young children was to take some of our older bread, the stale bread, you know, and take it down and feed the ducks and the geese at the pond. And you go with your sack full of dried bread. And the minute you start throwing the food in the water, you become the center of attention. The ducks and geese, the word gets out so quickly from all the corners of the pond and on the far shore, the ducks and the geese are just coming like a multitude towards you. They'll walk all over each other, each one trying to get closer to you than the next. And it's kind of a nice feeling. You're kind of the center of attention, the most popular person there on the pond. But then the sack goes empty. And all of a sudden, the ducks lose interest. And as quickly as they came to take of the food that you brought for them, they leave just as quickly, and they're searching for the next opportunity. We don't even like to admit it, but the truth is they never were really interested in you. They were interested only in the food that you brought. And it kind of hurts. These throngs of people, pilgrims on the way to the Passover, were not really interested in Jesus. They were interested in the gifts that he brought. They, like so many ducks, were there really for the free food. And how that must have hurt our Lord. Now, as the chapter continues, the people express their disappointment in Christ because he wouldn't give them what they wanted. Verses 32 through 34. Verses 32 through 34. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Evermore. That is every day. Keep on giving it to us. We like the free meal. We would like it evermore and more and more and more. You can no more give a selfish man enough miracles to make him happy than you can give a selfish man enough money to make him happy. All he wants is more and more and more. Now Christ is likely to disappoint a person like that by not giving us what we want if what we want is not what's good for us. I know we don't like to admit it, but we all are tempted sometimes to think of Christ as the great divine Santa Claus. And if you ask Santa Claus for something and you don't get it, and you ask again for the same thing next year and again and again, 
and you never do get what you ask Santa Claus to bring, eventually you're strongly inclined to lose faith in Santa Claus. And when we ask Christ to do something for us, then he doesn't do it. We all are tempted to lose faith in Jesus. We ask him to keep us from getting cancer. We ask him to make us a little better off than the folk that don't love him. To see to it that our kids are good, that the family is alive and well and happy. To see to it that we don't lose our jobs when maybe others are being downsized. And when Christ doesn't do those things for us, we are tempted sometimes to think that God is not good or that he doesn't really love us. Christ is not Santa Claus. He didn't promise to always bring us what we ask for. Now notice what he did promise in verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Everlasting life, Christ promises. And as I've thought and thought and tried and tried to boil it down, it seems to me that at least essentially, Christ really promises only two things. Eternal life, and growth in character. And anything else that you ask of him, he is likely to give or to deny depending upon how they affect those two. His promise is eternal life and growth in character. And he gives or withholds all other blessings depending upon whether they help us to claim those two promises. We should not follow Christ just so he'll change our circumstances. We ought not to be upset when he denies what we ask because, you see, the truth of the matter is we don't really know what we need. We say, now look, God, if you will just give me what I need, I will be happy with you. I will serve you to the day I die. But you don't know what you need. You don't know what you need any more than those people knew what they needed and they thought they knew for sure. Verses 14 and 15, just after the feeding of the 5,000, verse, verses 14 and 15, and these men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again unto a mountain himself alone. They were about to take him by force. They thought that what they needed was a king, an army commander, and they were ready to draft him right then and there by force if necessary. Well, just think about their army. He could heal the wounded. He could even raise the dead. And it had just been proven that he could feed the hungry. Their army would be invincible. They would just throw Rome out. They were sure they knew what they needed. And when Jesus refused to give them what they thought they needed because it was really not what they needed, they didn't want Jesus anymore. We want Christ to change our circumstances. He wants to change our character we want Christ to answer our prayers so there won't be any more aches when we wake up in the morning. So that we'll have to work less while making more money. Brethren and sisters, if Christ granted our selfish prayers, he would simply be teaching us to be more selfish still. We need to understand that we don't really know what we need. Don't you see, life can only be understood backwards, but it can only be lived forwards. 
And if you've had the good fortune to have lived a few extra years, as many of us have, you can look back, I'm sure, on many of those things that you thought were the world's worst trials at the time and smile now and say, Lord, now I understand it was what I needed all the while. We should be very careful about what we pray for because we don't really know what we need. So let's not pray to God so much to change our circumstances. Let's pray that Jesus will instead change us. The basic reason for following Christ is because he can change you and not so that he will change your circumstance. Oh, those crowds didn't want it that way. They wanted their circumstances changed, and Jesus wanted to change them. They said, Jesus, just change the Romans. The poor peasants said, Jesus, change our oppressive landlords. Jesus, we will follow you if you will just change the world, or at least our little corner of the world. And we're not any different. We say, Jesus, change the hypocrite in the church. Can't you make them nicer or just get rid of them, one or the other? And when we have difficulty at home, we say, Lord, change my wife, change my husband. Change the kids, make them more respectful, make them more loving, make them more obedient. And when things don't go too well at work, Lord, change my boss. Somebody is unkind to us, Lord, change the unlovely. Brothers and sisters, those are unchristian prayers because the way Christ taught that Christianity makes changes is by first changing us and not our circumstances. Christianity, Christ in us, makes us more loving. It makes us more tolerant. It makes us more patient and kind. It makes us more forgiving. It changes us. It's right here in the words of Jesus, verse 53. John chapter 6 and verse 53. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And notice the analogies in this chapter. Jesus likens himself to flesh that is eaten or to blood in the body. And if you look at verses 48 through 51, to bread. Now what do all of those things have in common? They work from within. What good is food if you rub it on your skin? Food doesn't do you any good until it works from within. And even a doctor will get excited when blood which has been on the inside suddenly is coming out on the outside and starts pouring through a hole someplace because blood is meant to do its work from within. Jesus used these analogies to help us understand that Christ also works from within. That the problem you bring to church this morning is not a problem of circumstances. The problem you bring to church this morning is a problem within. Let's stop blaming our families. Let's stop blaming the church. Let's stop blaming the people around us. Your problem is yourself. My problem is myself. Lord, change me. Jesus is saying that he wants to come and begin his work, not by changing the circumstances outside you, but by bringing a power to work within you. Jesus wants to change you. He wants to change me. Stop centering upon how you need to change your circumstances. Begin within. That's the lesson that Jesus brings. Now, if we should not follow Christ for the bread, if we should not follow Christ so that he will change the circumstances around us, why should we follow him? What are the right reasons? Let me suggest today two reasons. Perhaps you can think of many more. But I believe this morning that you should give yourself to Christ, first of all, 
because he gave himself to you. Why follow Jesus? Why go after him? Because he came after you. Our opening hymn this morning, I will sing of Jesus' love. Sing of him who first loved me. For he left bright worlds above and died on Calvary. Oh, the depths of love divine. Earth or heaven can never know how that sins as dark as mine can be made as white as snow. I will sing of Jesus' love. Endless praise my heart shall give. He has died that I might live. I will sing of his love to me. Amen. First John 4, 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. He gave you all there was of him. Shouldn't that help us all give all of ourselves to him? Notice now verse 28 of John chapter 6, verse 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Isn't that interesting? You see, these folks were willing to do some work in order to have Jesus as their king, in order to have Jesus control things for them. What work shall we do? They were willing to do almost any work, almost anything. And isn't that the way the religions of the world Isn't that what they're based on? What do I have to do to make myself acceptable to the gods or to God? Christians fall under the same problem. What do I need to do in order to earn God's favor, in order to receive eternal life? What shall we do, Lord? Jesus answered in verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he has sent. That's the work. They were willing to do any work, but salvation was only through believing in Jesus. Salvation is found only in a person, righteousness by faith in Christ alone. Brother and sister, the price of heaven is not work. The price of heaven is Jesus. And those people back there like us today may have been prepared to pay nearly any price other than relationship. The price of admission to heaven is knowing Jesus. Verse 47 Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The second reason that we ought to give ourselves to Jesus is because he can make us into something that the world needs. In verse 11, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, verse 11. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. And the twelfth verse says, they were filled. An enormous crowd of people were filled. Those five small loaves of barley, and those two insignificant little fish, in the hands of Jesus, multiplied so overwhelmingly that they fed a great multitude. Surely you don't have less than that to give to him this morning. If you'll just give what little you have in the hands of Jesus, the smallest thing, the most insignificant thing, can be multiplied to do a great work for the world. 
But here's where the old pillars of the church, the diet in the wool Christians, those who have been in the church, been Christians perhaps for many years, here's where we need to be very careful. The barley and the fish could not say the next day, you know, I was in the hands of Jesus yesterday, so I can multiply today. The only way the food could possibly have kept on multiplying would be if it stayed in the hands of Jesus. And there may be some of us that were in the hands of Jesus once, and we are still relying upon that experience as though we have some divine multiplying ability now within us. The strength to multiply belongs to the bread, it belongs to the fish, it belongs to you and to me only so long as we stay in the hands of Jesus. And so as we look at the multitudes who follow Jesus, we see that it is possible to follow Christ and be lost if we follow for the wrong reasons. Let's don't follow so that he will change our circumstances. Let's follow because we believe that he can change us. And if there is one person in this congregation today who is discouraged with your Lord because you have asked and asked and asked and he has said no and no and no, please understand that he is not breaking his promises. He will give you all that you need in the context of character growth and eternal life. But only he knows what you really truly need to accomplish those goals. The 66th verse of John chapter 6 says that the multitudes left and they walked with him no more. And then in verse 67, he turns to the disciples and he asks, will ye also go away? I'm convinced, folks, that the majority will never follow Christ for the right reasons that probably the majority who follow him will follow him for the wrong reasons. And when those multitudes forsook Jesus, he said, will ye also turn away? How about you today, this morning? Are you prepared to follow Jesus for the right reasons? One thing my wife and I enjoy doing often on a Sabbath afternoon is to go on a little drive. You know, so many beautiful mountains where it seemed like anywhere in southeastern Arizona, you're always, any direction you look, there's going to be mountains. And I enjoy, you know, we enjoy together driving through it, maybe try to cool off and go up, you know, Mount Lemon or Mount Graham or in the Huachucas. But there's many, many wonderful and interesting things to go that are a short drive away from where we live. We're very blessed. And so we enjoy doing that often, but I've noticed lately when we drive through, like a couple weeks ago, we were at Kochi Stronghold, brought the grandkids there. But along the way there, there's like more and more, you see these orchards of mainly pistachio trees. I don't know if you've driven out there and see, that seems to be the new cash crop, you know? Used to be apples a lot, and used to be pecans, and now almost every new orchard, with all these little saplings and some little taller and some mature trees, Pistachio seems to be the big crop. The last time I drove through there, it was kind of interesting because they were irrigating the land. And you could see the water just gushing out of those big, enormous pipes, just flooding the fields, irrigating. But it was interesting that right next to where the water was gushing out was a rig drilling another well. And I thought, well, it's obviously they've got plenty of water here. The trees look healthy. The water's flowing. And at first it doesn't make sense. But the problem is that the water table is going lower. 
And unless the farmer digs a new and a deeper well, one day he will be without water. I believe our relationship with Jesus should be like that. Interestingly enough, when we first accept him, he understands we do it partially for selfish reasons. Maybe all we have is a shallow well. But the longer we know him, the deeper the well ought to be. And we ought to come this morning to the place that we serve him for the right reasons. Are you willing to go deeper in your relationship with your Lord this morning? Give yourself to Christ for the right reasons. Give yourself to Christ because he gave himself to you. Give yourself to Christ because he can make of you something that this world desperately needs. Lord, Change me. Our dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful we serve such a patient God. You will accept us even if sometimes we come to you for the wrong reasons. But Lord, we stand before you today wanting a deeper relationship with you, a deeper well, a well that will produce water so that we will never thirst again. The bread of life that will fill us so that we want no more. Lord, we need Jesus. We need him in our personal lives. We need him in our families. We need him in our church family. Lord, give us Jesus. May we each day submit to your direction and your plan for our life, knowing that only you really truly know what we need. Lord, we're so thankful for the promise of character growth, the promise of eternal life. And we know that you will be faithful and you can be trusted to deliver on those promises. Lord, help us to understand that only you know how to best achieve those goals. So may each day we start each day talking to you, looking at your will for our lives, understanding your will for us, and helping us to be changed through the power of your Holy Spirit working from within. And then, Lord, as we are changed and we go out to work for you, empower us and strengthen us. Give us the ability to multiply the gifts that we have, no matter how humble, no matter how small. May we put our gifts in the hands of Jesus so that he will multiply them abundantly to be a blessing for this world, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.